And then I woke up because I heard my friend next to me kind of whispering through the pillow, you know, like, Lydia, there's two guys in the room and I think one of them has a gun. And just the whole sweat, just like, you know, I just woke up from a dream and then it was like, is this real? And I just remembered all the blood just like rushed, like it felt like it was draining out of my body and I just started sweating. But I looked over and true enough, there were two guys and one of them had a gun, a black gun in his hand and something just came over me. And I just remember thinking, I am not fucking dying today. Like at all, this is not happening. is The Maverick Show, where you'll meet today's most interesting real estate investors, entrepreneurs, and world travelers, and learn the strategies and tactics they use to succeed. And now, here's your host, Matt Bowles. Hey, everybody. It's Matt Bowles. Welcome to The Maverick Show. My guest today is Lydia Lee. She is a location-independent entrepreneur, work reinvention strategist, true purpose coach and founder of Screw the Cubicle. She helps passionate individuals, change makers, and adventurous souls discover the work they're meant to do, impact the world purposefully, and design an inspired life. Since 2013, Lydia has helped hundreds of people transition out of the golden corporate handcuffs and build meaningful businesses that support them in living their dream life. She helps each client create a purpose-driven business based on their personal strengths, values, and personality so that they build a business that they truly love and want to keep for years to come. Born in Penang, Malaysia, Lydia grew up primarily in Vancouver, Canada, and is now based in Bali, Indonesia. She's a sought-after speaker on work reinvention, solopreneurship, and lifestyle freedom. Her work has been featured in Forbes, The Telegraph, The Huffington Post, Elle Magazine, and the list goes on. Lydia, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Can I bore your voice to introduce me like everywhere? Because that was an awesome introduction. <laughs> well, you deserve an awesome introduction. And it is about time that I got you on this podcast because you and I know all sorts of amazing people in common, including a number of people that Maverick Show listeners know, like Ella Cook and uh, Lavinia Yosub and other people that have been on this podcast. So we roll in a lot of the same circles. And I am so excited to finally have you on the show. I know. It's about time. I don't know how we didn't get to meet, but we get to have this conversation today. So it's going to be pretty epic. It's going to be super awesome. And I feel like we should start with Malaysia, where Mm. you were born, because it's a country that I have a lot of love for. And you and I have bonded over our appreciation of Malaysian food and culture and everything else. So I I, I want to just let you start there a little bit and talk about your Mm. experience In Malaysia, where you were born, I know you moved when you were young, but you've, of course, been back since. But for folks that haven't been to Malaysia or that haven't been to Penang in particular, can you open up with that and share a little bit about where you're originally from? Definitely. Penang is a special place. And I know I'm a little biased in saying that for sure. And to be honest, I had to I rediscovered it as an adult going back to Penang uh, in my early 20s after not being there for a while. And then just reconnecting with the culture and the food and the people. And it's quite funny. The first time I, I went back to Penang, I brought some Canadian friends with me for our first ever Southeast Asia trip. And I remember the first thing they said to me at the airport was that, are you sure you, you know, you told us that people are really nice here and they are a little blunt and in and direct and in your face. Like, I'm not quite <laughs> sure how to deal with this. And I had to kind of educate them on Malaysian language and how, yes, we are very blunt people. Yes, we're very direct and no bullshit. But isn't that what we kind of appreciate <laughs> of honesty? But yeah, the accent can be quite daunting at times. You know, Singaporeans have the same accent. A lot of laws, if you remember that. Um, a lot of kind of Malaysian English or Singlish if you're in Singapore. Uh, But yeah, you know, Penang has a special place in my heart because it obviously is a place I grew up. I didn't grow up there for that many years. I was there till I was about six or seven years old, you know, in, in Pulau Pinang, we call it, right, Penang. And then I moved to Kuala Lumpur. 
for my parents to get better jobs. And my mom worked at HSBC in the city. And then from about, you know, seven to 10 years old, this is the time we were in Kuala Lumpur. And then we immigrated to uh, Canada. After a failure immigration to Montreal, we couldn't learn French fast enough to be eligible <laughs> to go to Quebec and Montreal, uh, but we were accepted to Vancouver. So majority of my life has been in Vancouver, Canada. But, you know, it's an interesting sort of identity transition for me as well, even as an adult, you know, kind of finding my footing on like, where do I really belong? <laughs> you know, I've got a, a foot or a toe, you know, in the Malaysian culture and the Chinese culture and, and very heavily uh, religious Christian culture, which I grew up from as well. And then obviously my life in Vancouver, Canada and the Western culture. And then now, you know, been living in Bali and all over the place for the last eight years almost, right? It's like sometimes I do wonder if I had children, what is the culture I am going to be teaching them? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I love Malaysia. And one of the things that is just so amazing about it that you and I have bonded over is is how good the food is in Malaysia. And most of my time in Malaysia, I've spent in Kuala Lumpur, which I think is one of the best food cities in the world. Um, mm. And a number of my guests have have talked about that as well, about how much they love that. And one of the things that's really unique, I think, about KL as well is in addition to the Chinese population and the Malaysian uh, population, you also have almost a third of the city is Indian, right? Yes. M- mostly from South India. And the Indian food in KL mm. is just unbelievable. Uh, the banana leaf. Yeah. The banana leaf restaurant. Big old banana leaves. Yeah, it's great. Uh, It's just amazing. So it's really one of my favorite places. When I would just want to go on an eating trip, just a culinary trip, Malaysia is like right at the top of my international list. Totally. I mean, it, it, it really is a melting pot, like a real melting pot of culture there, you know, and I because I grew up, you know, when we ate dinner, there would be at least six to eight different dishes on the table. You know, if you go to a hawker stand in Penang or Malaysia or even Singapore, like it is your taste. I mean, my mouth is watering like right now, like salivating, <laughs> just thinking about the laksa, the satay, the chicken rice, you know, all the things. And I've just never experienced food of that kind of variety in one sitting, you know, and that's why it's no surprise when one of the first meals I cooked my Malaysian mother, when I moved into my first place as an adult, you know, my own independent home and invited her over for dinner and I cooked her pasta and she was so offended. (laughs) And she said to me, Lydia, why am I just eating one taste over and over again? Like that's not variety. That's not what I taught you. (laughs) So we're very used to our taste buds being, you know, eight different dishes at one go. That's amazing. That's so awesome. So then t- talk a little bit about your journey then, right? From Malaysia to Vancouver, and then ultimately, I mean, we'll get into your sort of your your world travel journey, but as you moved around as a kid growing up internationally, different languages, different cultures, all of that, and now that you've been back to Malaysia as an adult, how did you navigate that cultural identity dynamic for you? Like at different ages in your life, how did you navigate that? And how do you sort of see yourself now? Yeah, it's gone through a lot of transitions as, you know, it's very normal to do that as you live a a bigger life. I think when I was younger, you know, especially during my teenage years, it was just the, the intention I had when I moved to Canada was just wanting to belong, you know, wanting to fit in to the schools and fit in with the culture. And I think this is very common for immigrant kids, right, where they can get quite embarrassed almost about where they came from, because, you know, when my mom packed up my lunch, you know, for the day, it was food that just stunk up the entire lunchroom, you know, like, and you would be so embarrassed. Like I would used to throw my Tupperware into the garbage just so that I could go and buy, you know, macaroni and cheese or fries with gravy or poutine, as we like to call it in Canada, you know, cheesy fries with gravy on top, just to feel that I was a normal kid, you know? And so even with things like sleepovers, when I had people over in my house, you know, my mom would never have, you know, Coca-Cola, soft drinks, cake, like anything yummy for children. And we would have sort of like, you know, fish cakes or, you know, like really stinky, weird Chinese snacks, you know, like a squid chips or whatever. And that was, I would say my teenage years was like an embarrassing stage of my life of like, even though I enjoyed my culture, it was a sense of like, what's this going to cost me friends? You know, is it going to cost me not belonging to a place like this? Right. So that was sort of what happened in my teenage years. And then when I was about 12, 13 years old, my parents split up and had a, a massive divorce, a very chaotic divorce where I was sent to live with my father. And, you know, there's a whole story there and I won't make this a therapy show, but 
in my years of kind of going from 13 years old to, you know, my 20s, you know, my father and I had a tumultuous relationship where he kind of decided he didn't want children after the divorce. So he was very adamant with me to say that we are roommates and you have all the freedom you can have. And I had to go through another transition of independency and understanding what life was like without a father and not knowing the repercussions of that till later on in my adult life, right? So I moved out of the house at 17 years old because I was paying rent to my father at 16. You know, so I thought I might as well just move out and do my own thing. But, you know, through those stages of childhood and adulthood, it has taught me resilience. It has taught me a lot of muscles that I do appreciate these days as an adult. And then as I went into the corporate world, you know, as I made, tried to make something of myself, because, you know, my parents gave up a lot to bring us to Canada, right? You know, we had to, you know, Malaysian currency is like three times less, right, than Canada. So all, everything, we weren't even rich to begin with in Malaysia. So we were like in poverty for a long time for the first five years of immigrating to Canada. So that it was really instilled in my mindset that I better make something of myself for all the sacrifices that they've given, you know, to bring me to a first world country. And so I never went on like, you know, when people took sabbaticals and um, trips as students to go abroad, I never did any of those things because I had to get a student loan pretty quickly pave everything my way. I was living outside of, you know, my home as well. So I had to pay for rent and get extra loans and get into myself into a lot more debt, right? But I was working at a young age and I really had to finish school at a young age and just get going, you know, with my corporate career. And of course, you know, through my sort of mid twenties, early uh, late twenties is when I had my sort of health breakdown, right? That sort of became the trajectory of, okay, what else is going to be for me besides corporate life? But even in my early adulthood of sort of, um, you know, thinking a lot about what is my version of happiness? Cause I didn't actually understand what that looked like because I was so busy surviving in my teenage years and surviving in my early adulthood, I didn't have time to contemplate these privileged thoughts of what I want to do with my life. It was more about just how do I feed myself and put a roof over my head. Yeah. And so let's talk a little bit about, I'm, I'm, cause I'm really curious, like, given what you're saying about you didn't study abroad, you didn't do a lot of this stuff, because now you've traveled to 30 plus countries and you're you know all over the world and you've lived abroad extensively and all of this kind of stuff. So I'm curious about where that came from how that initially came about, you know, your love and passion and desire for travel. And what were some of your first international trips that you took? When did you take them and where did you go? I was a bit of a late bloomer. You know, I, I didn't travel outside of Canada or maybe Mexico. I think I did like an all-inclusive something or rather with my girlfriends in my early 20s, something cheap and easy. And, you know, we in Canada, we don't have just like the United States, we don't have yearly vacation days that are past like a week or two weeks. Um, it was rare that you would get a three-week holiday all at once, you know. And if I had a three-week a moment, you know, with my seniority at a corporate job, you would have to split it. Like they would never allow you to take it all in one streak, right? So it's like a week at a time. And that wasn't really traveling experience, was it? You know, it took you a week just to realize you're on vacation. But my first, one of my first kind of international trips was uh, that trip I told you about of bringing my girlfriends to, you know, Malaysia. And we traveled to th Southeast Asia. I think I was about 20, 23 years old at the time, 24, perhaps even. And we went to Singapore, went to Bangkok and parts of Thailand, uh, all over Malaysia. We were in Hong Kong, you know. So we spent quite a number of weeks in kind of different locations. But even then, it wasn't an immersion sort of experience that I get to experience these days. But it was the first taste of what it felt like to be back in Southeast Asia again. And actually, during that trip was a wonderful meeting with a German guy on a boat uh, when I was taking my aunt, who I was meeting in Penang, who was kind of like a second mother to me, we were taking a boat ride somewhere and I met this German guy. And this is when the four hour work week was like a thing. You know, the, the book was really popular. I sort of just leafed through it. I didn't feel like it was my thing because it was all these case studies around technical entrepreneurs, like coders, programmers, web designers. And I never, I just went, oh, that's, oh, I have to learn that skill in order to be location independent. And I, I am not that person. So this is not for me, right? And I never really finished the book. And anyway, I met this guy. He started telling me that he was in marketing, very similar background as I had, and that he was working six months out of the year because he sort of figured out a way to cut his living costs down by living abroad and still be able to do this marketing thing of, of a consulting agency using the internet. You know, this is many years ago. It's like nine years ago. So I was like, what? Like, you can do that? <laughs> People 
hire you through the internet? <laughs> like that was really how surprised I was. But he was the first guy that planted the seed for me in that conversation that there was a different opportunity, a different option other than a nine to five. Even though I wasn't ready for that leap just yet, it was that first inaugural leap that was planted. And then it was two years after that, that I left my job. But you know, it wasn't immediate. But that trip certainly was, I think, one of the milestone chapters that I think made a difference for the choices I made in the future. And what were some of the highlights of that trip just on a travel level in terms of what inspired you from that trip to want to continue to travel the world, see more of the world? And by the way, was that the trip that you mentioned to me where you just told me very vaguely about this, that you had to run in with guys with guns or something like that? Yes. Was that was that on this particular trip? Because yeah. I definitely want to hear that story. Yeah, it was. It was. I mean... Just even living, I mean, Southeast Asia is a culture very close to me. So I, I wouldn't say that, you know, this was the moment that I went, oh my God, I just want to travel for the rest of my life. Actually, my corporate job after that was what became the catalyst for travel, funny enough, right? Because I, I worked for international education. I was a business development director working with the Embassy of Canada and the trade mission of Canada to promote education in Canada. So I was traveling six months out of the year abroad. I was sent to places like Russia, you know, Lithuania. Uh, Switzerland, France, all sorts of places I would probably have never been able to afford to go myself, working, of course, and attending conferences. But it get, that was actually what gave me the travel bug, you know, of, of being in cultures and religion and uh, people that were not like me at all. Whereas, you know, my Southeast Asia trip, I got it. I understood what Malaysians were like. And, you know, Thai people were similar in some ways, right? So it wasn't so much out of my comfort zone. But going to Russia, you know, going to Lithuania, that was very different for me. And I, I, I really basked in that sort of foreign place, you know. But yeah, the story with the gunmen, <laughs> which sounds very scary. And it it was indeed very scary at the time, but we were staying in like a homestay in uh, Koh Samui, I think, and one of the Koh's, right? <laughs> Koh Samui, I, I, I'm pretty sure. Um, and so we were taking a nap. We've been traveling for quite a bit because, you know, we didn't have a lot of money at the time when we traveled. So we took like the slow boat. You know, you paid half the price to get there 12 hours later when the fast boat would have taken you there like in three hours time, right? So we've been traveling overnight on some rickety boat that was like in monsoon weather. There were no life jackets. It was horrible and risky, but we did it anyway. We landed in this island. We booked a homestay, shared, you know, four women, four girls sharing two beds and we just took a nap and then I woke up because I heard my friend next to me kind of whispering through the pillow you know like Lydia there's two guys in the room and I think one of them has a gun and just the cold sweat just like you know I just woke up from a dream and then it was like is this real and I just remembered all the blood just like rushed like it felt like it was draining out of my body and I just started sweating but I looked over and true enough, there were two guys topless, two in like sarongs or, you know, something. And one of them had a gun, a black gun in his hand, just kind of at his hip and swaying about in the room. And everyone, it's funny, like how people react to a situation like that, because I think if I was to have thought about that situation and someone went, how would you have reacted? I would have probably been like, oh, I've been so scared shitless. I probably would be like completely frozen, which is exactly what my girlfriends were doing. They just stared like sort of, you know, wide eyed. No one did anything. And something just came over me. And I just remember thinking, I am not fucking dying today. Like, at all. This is not happening. And so I didn't think very much logically in step-by-step -step motion of what to do, but I just sort of leapt up from bed and I started acting as if I knew why they were here and that I thought, oh, our boyfriend sent you to clean the room, right? Oh yeah, our boyfriends are coming back really soon. Just to plant the seed that there's other people coming that were males, coming into the room. I just sort of wanted to confuse them. And then they kind of backed off and was confused because I was all of a sudden very excited. <laughs> they were there. Like I was almost the opposite of the reaction perhaps that they anticipated. And I just went, oh good, you're here. You're here to change the cot. Oh yeah, we needed an extra bed. Oh, our boyfriend sent you and went off and it confused. Them. They were just like, what the fuck is going on? And then I just kept thinking, I need to back them back into the, the sort of patio section of the homestay so that we would be outdoors and not be inside this room. And then I kept making stuff up like, oh, the cleaning supplies are out here. Let me show you. Let me show you. And I just opened the door and shoved them outside just so that we could have passerbys come by, right? Anyway, long, horrific story short, <laughs> what was actually the truth was they were working for the homestay. What he was holding was a BB gun. 
that looked very much like a pistol. <laughs> and he was wave and he had no awareness that waving a gun of any kind in front of women or anyone was a no no. And so later on, they would laugh about it when we would walk back from the beach to our homestay. He would literally point his gun fingers at me and say, hey, hey, pew, pew. Because he thought it was the most hilarious thing that he thought he was going to shoot me. <laughs> so that's the story of gunpoint. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Oh and that was your first kind of major international trip. So that's quite a story to tell. So I do also want to hear about Russia because you mentioned it was really impactful for you. I actually went to Russia for the first time in 2019. I spent about a month there, went to St. Petersburg, Ooh. went to Moscow, and then I took the Trans-Siberian Railway all the way wow. across Siberia to Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia, which was absolutely amazing. But I remember you telling me, though, that Russia also, that trip happened to be a totally transformative moment in your life overall in terms of your life trajectory. So I'd love to hear about in general, how your experience in Russia was, and then also, you know, what that transformative moment was all about and what that led to. Yeah. So I was in Moscow in 20, 2011, or sorry, 2012, actually, that was the year, it was January. It was right after 2011. I was there in January after New Year's to do another conference there. I was visiting Turkey, Ukraine, and Russia uh, in order to do this trade mission with the Embassy of Canada. And so but by that time, I already, already been traveling quite often. And as I mentioned, you know, six months of travel is my usual schedule every year. Sounder, actually, that was why I took the job, actually, was because it allowed travel. And I thought, well, this is my opportunity, you know, to see the world without it being on my bank account. Uh, and it sounded really sexy on paper that I would be, oh, you know, living in hotel rooms and, you know, going abroad and all these beautiful places. And in real life, in reality, you know, that lifestyle was hard, you know, and for someone who very much values um, friendship and relationships and my family and time, you know, and freedom of time, it wasn't giving me that reality, you know, at all. And you don't think about those things, I think, when you try to go for a particular job for a status or pay or, you know, opportunity. I'm not, I wasn't questioning like, you know, oh, if I took this job, uh, would it affect my lifestyle choices? Like that was not even a question in my head. It was just, hey, the pay is great. I get to be uh, a, sen a senior level role in due time. Um, it was a boutique education industry. So I wasn't working for big universities, which I really liked. And maybe I could impact change in a, in a much better way this way, right? Instead of the bureaucracy of a bigger organization. And in a lot of ways, the job was excellent for me to build the skills that I now have in terms of how I built relationships, how I educate, right? how I present and showcase a vision. Loved it in that regard. What I didn't love was sort of the very toxic workplace environment, the inability to take time off. And by that time that I was in Russia, I had not gone on any personal vacation days for two years. So you can imagine, and I didn't even know I was anxious or had, you know, I had panic attacks at night, which I thought was normal. I just thought it was, it was genetic because my mother sort of had anxiety and it was sort of a bloodline thing in her side of the family. So I never questioned that this job was creating that reality for myself. And so when I was in Moscow, I was, I think, my third day there going on uh, another round of agency meetings uh, and they packed my schedule in. So I have to see eight agents a day to promote the school, right? And so it was exhausting. I was jet lagged, as I said, you know, exhausted. And, and it was just one of those moments, maybe it's everything came together, the jet lag, the winter in Russia, the not taking a holiday, the panic attacks, all of it sort of come into like this crashing halt. And I was about to go on my eight meetings of the day and I was calling my boyfriend at the time. And all of a sudden I just lost it. And I just said something like, I don't want to be here. This sucks. Like none of this feels motivating anymore. I just want to come home. And I just started almost acting a little bit insane. And he said to me, you're so on the ball all the time. And so like, what is happening? Are you having your period? Like what's happening here? <laughs> you know, that is like causing this like emotional reaction. But, and I couldn't even pinpoint what specifically happened that day for me to have this ripple effect of this moment. But from that, I had, I basically had a panic attack on the phone with him talking about what I need to do for the day, and then developed temporary agoraphobia where I couldn't leave the hotel room for two days from fear of something happening to me. So it was a crazy, I've never felt something like that ever again, but it was definitely my physical body, my mental, spiritual, everything of who I was that was just like, 
this is you're going to you're going to stop now because you don't know how to stop. And so we're going to do something to make sure that you take a necessary pause. And that was necessary. It was scary. And it was a breakdown that I'm not, you know, like want to relive again. But it was absolutely for me, a catalyst for a breakthrough and a change because it forced me to look at what wasn't working because I wasn't going to do that on a conscious level. And what did you find when you took the step back and you said, okay, this is clearly a sign I need to reflect on things now. What did you discover? And then what did you change? And what was the next part of your trajectory from there? Mm. Well, luckily, I got a really good therapist (laughs) that didn't shove a bunch of pills down my throat. Instead, asked me really powerful, relevant questions. And as with, you know, things that are unfulfilling and dissatisfying, it's hard to pinpoint what it is. And, and, you know, she asked me, like, what do you think caused this panic attack and what happened? And I said, I don't know. I really don't. And so until we started having several sessions, I took a little mini sabbatical from work, which is, again, really necessary for me to just heal and get back to feeling somewhat okay again to get back to work. And I had sessions three times a week for two to three weeks with my therapist in order to kind of get to the bottom of what was activating some of this anxiety and panic attacks. And so I haven't talked to anyone about it. So it was really great to have an outlet that wasn't my friends, my family, or my partner to dump on uh, and have someone neutral to kind of point out certain blind spots and you know certain things that I was perhaps validating in my head or believing that that is just how normal things happen. Happen and and questioning my mindset on what was normal and what was my version of success and what did I think what was the cost of my success in a way right or what do I believe that I had to accomplish in order to feel successful and so a lot of the work we did brought me to realize that actually I still hold on to a lot of these learnings that I had from my parents about about getting to success because they gave up a lot and sacrifice and you know sweat blood and tears to get to like some version of mediocre success and so I always felt that even if I worked hard and got a promotion or got the money or do the things because I you know in a great six-figure job it never felt enough it just never physically felt enough you know so I would push myself over and over again from the fear that someone would take over my job, someone would take over, you know, my position, because that was what was taught to us as immigrants is that if you don't work twice as hard as the white people, you know, you work with in the office, you ain't getting the role. So, you know, that was the stuff that I carried on that was unconscious. That was my doing as well, right? In projecting the insecurity and then working very hard. So knowing that was helpful. On the other side of the um, unhappiness was actually I was in a in a in a corporation where the values were no longer in alignment with what I thought I bought into, you know, and so I was selling products, selling this idea of education in these schools when I knew the truth of what was happening in, behind closed doors of the quality, you know, and what we did, you know, to perhaps you know slide under the radar sometimes for certain things, and I was selling something I no longer believed in, which absolutely ate me up inside, which I also I didn't realize, you know. So there was a combination of a few things that I think I discovered was causing that dissatisfaction and unfulfillment. Okay, and then once you realized that, what then was your path to? entrepreneurship. How did you get from there once you're dissatisfied and you realize there's no longer the right alignment and then being able to make that transformative step and build a location independent business? What was that transition like for you? There were definitely a few stages of transition because I, I never saw myself as, as an entrepreneur from the get-go. I, I, I never had examples of entrepreneurs in my family. No one did that. Everyone got in line and did what they're told, right? It's just what we do. Um, and so my first instinct was not to be a business owner, actually. My first instinct was to see how I could remain at that organization and improve my conditions in that space, which I don't think is a wrong way to go because you know, some, some people I know actually love working, you know, in an organization, but they don't love the culture or the toxic, you know, parts of certain things. And there might be an opportunity to change things. So, you know, I would have meetings with the owners and sort of told them about the things that weren't happy. I was happy with, you know, things that I wasn't, uh, you know, there was a huge turnover as well in staff every single year, which affected my performance and hiring and, you know, all the things that I had to do as a department head. Um, and I needed things to change and support in that department in order for me to feel happier and not be the only one traveling constantly, that I wasn't able to do that anymore. And so 
funny enough, they had these meetings with me several times. And then the final meeting, which was a deciding factor for me, whether I should stay or go, instead of actually listening to what I mentioned were causing unfulfillment and dissatisfaction, instead, their proposal was, we've decided to make you partner and pay you more money. And will you continue if that happens? And so in my head, I was like, you didn't listen to anything I said. So you're paying me off again, right? And, and money is the asset here. And I no longer am okay with that game. So I thank them for the opportunity because I was the youngest person to ever been offered a partnership in their organization of 25 years, which is great. Um, and instead, what I did a week later was to say, instead of losing me completely, thank you for the opportunity, what if I renegotiated my role as a consultant? What if I'm able to get what I want to and give you what you want to and continue building some of these relationships that you were trying to build in parts of Asia that I had a project in? And we would sort of give Europe to a new person and I would train that person up. I would make sure they're transitioning well to my role, but I will continue to be a consultant. You don't have to pay for my office space. You don't have to pay for my medical care. We'll, you'll work out financially for you at the end. I get to work from home. I come for meetings maybe every two weeks. We can do that. And so we actually, I transitioned into consultancy in the beginning of time for eight months working for them as a consultant about 20 hours a week, which brought me some security financially, right? Because at the time I didn't have a lot of savings, not good with money. It gave me the, the sort of platform to go, okay, as long as I can pay my rent and bills, I feel safe enough to then be creative enough to go, what else could it be next, right? Survival skills, totally cool. Now I can get to the next level of creativity <laughs> and trying something new and not risk it all, right? So then I started a boutique agency uh, in the international education industry and started to um, partner up with different schools and different agents internationally to sell particular programs. I would customize like summer camps and winter camps for kids and did that business for a while. Then I started to really step into full-time entrepreneurship. I had full-time clients, you know, had an agency that was thriving, but... I was still having trouble getting up in the morning. <laughs> and I thought, hello, I'm working from my underpants and I get to do whatever I want. Like I thought this was it. <laughs> and yet I still felt this nagging feeling that this is now not it. And that felt even more disappointing because I built, you know, so much time and energy into building a business. And yet it didn't eradicate this feeling of, whatever I was seeking for. And, and so that's when I started writing a blog called Screw the Cubicle to document my identity crisis of going through employee to entrepreneurship and what this felt like just as an outlet, a, a place to send my mother who was questioning my life choices and my friends. And then it wasn't until a client or a reader, I guess, at the time from Toronto who was a lawyer and messaged me and said, I'm reading your blog. You know, I'm a little bit older than you, but your career trajectory is so similar. And all the questions I'm asking is what you're talking about. And I wonder if you do any coaching for career transitioners. And I was like, what is coaching? And then I had to Google it, you know, but that was again, a, every little micro choice led to, you know, the next stage of my evolving um, identity, I guess, as an entrepreneur and taking on, you know, that first client beta testing a little bit with whether or not I even wanted to coach and all this sort of stuff, you know, and then about a year after that, um, yeah, that became my full-time gig and I closed down the agency. That's amazing. You know, one of the things you said that I think is really important and significant is that you found a way to create a location independent life for yourself and you had achieved a lot of the things that you initially thought that you wanted to achieve. And then all of a sudden you realized that you still weren't happy with that because it was lacking certain things, a level of meaning, a level of purpose, uh, mm. a level of invigoration for you. Can you talk a little bit about how you sort of reflected on that and then transitioned to something that was meaningful and purposeful and and what tips you have um, around that or what your sort of overall reflections are on on that concept and how to make sure that you have that at the core of your business or your entrepreneurial endeavor. Yeah. And I think meaning is an overnight 
thing that we can define for ourselves right away. I think that's the first thing I want to say, right? Because we, when we think about purpose, you know, or what's our purpose? What's our meaning of life? It's a big question. And I think what keeps people stuck and even taking the next step to figure out what that is, is because they're expecting a Gandhi moment, right? Where I wake up and I just go exact, I know exactly what to do with my life and this is it. And, and very likely this isn't going to happen for most people. Like, to me, meaning is an experience. Like you make it meaningful, right? Or you go and follow your nose towards particular directions of what clues perhaps your life might have given to you. And it's just sort of, you know, even if you're not quite sure, it's take the reins, just go, let me just follow my nose down this rabbit hole and see what happens, which is very much what I did with Screw the Cubicle with no intention to monetize it at all. It wasn't a thing I was ever going to turn into a business, but because the energy was had the right intention of just, I wanted to share, I wanted to help someone else make this experience of leaving corporate, maybe not as hard or difficult and to share what all the money I've paid to therapy and, you know, all the money I've done and investments I've done on myself. What if I just allowed myself to share that with just the generosity and authenticity of wanting to share rather than a monetization model right away. And I think that's what really supported me in finding the meaning around the work of Screw the Cubicle was it was really coming from a place of that, well, if I found it meaningful to use entrepreneurship and independent work as a conduit, if you will, of self-awareness and understanding of self, you know, then maybe this is something worth sharing. You know, maybe this is something um, worth putting some time and energy on. You know, if it's affected me and impacted me in such a powerful way, perhaps there's someone out there, one person, two people just like me that might need the support, you know, and that was it. Nothing special, nothing magical about a niche or, you know, a, an algorithm or a formula that I got right. It was purely, purely my experience lent me, you know, the skill set, the know-how, the experience, the nuance in what happens during a transition to then support people to do that sort of thing. Right. And, and, you know, Matt, I still, have that question in my head in a lot of ways as I grow this business eight years later, because as I evolve as a human, different things are meaningful to me that wasn't meaningful to me five years ago. And that's okay. It doesn't mean I have an identity crisis again, or I'm a schizophrenic. It just means I'm evolving as a human and I'm adapting my work, my body of work to now match new values that I hold true to myself. And that's the beauty of business is that you're not waiting on a job title or a boss to tell you you're allowed to promote yourself or, you know, that you're allowed to evolve as who you are. You get to decide that whenever you wish and, and pivot and adapt your work as you see fit, right? I love that. And one of the things that I really like about your coaching model is that you take the individual people through a, a whole series of exercises and, and really go down and customize it very specifically for what each person loves to do and how they can make money doing what they love to do. And you interrogate this concept of their zone of genius, which I also want you to to talk about a little bit, but you, you do that. And then through that, you identify their personal version of success that's aligned with their personal values and priorities, right? So the solution is entirely customized and individualized for each person. It's not just, oh, here's a course module with a series of tactics on how everybody can do the same thing or achieve the same exact type of lifestyle or whatever, because everybody is different. So can you talk a little bit about that, the way you go through the zone of genius sort of exercises and how people should really think about customizing these businesses to their values and the things that they personally love doing? Mm, yeah, that's a great question. And something I wish I knew when I sort of had the question of what business should I start, you know, um, even though I'm very thankful for my first business, it taught me a lot. But, you know, I think if I had put a bit of work into defining that for myself, maybe I wouldn't have as much of that fuzzy feeling, you know, when I launched my business. But then again, every problem brings opportunity. And now, you know, that became the thing I do. And so, uh, you know, when I look at Genius Zones, I, I have a true belief that everyone is unique in their pathway, right? There's no one pathway or one blueprint for success. But I think every individual values different things. They have different weapons of choices to bring to the table, you know, of what creates and contributes their highest value in the world. And it's also in their approach, right? Like, I'm not the only coach ever that you're ever going to meet uh, all about career transitions or entrepreneurship. There's hundreds, if not millions of other people like me, right? But what is going to differentiate myself from other people or anyone from other competitors in their field is their story, is their perspective, 
is the framework of their process, you know, how you see the world differently and how you might approach solving problems differently, you know, and that's what I like people to own in instead of believing they have to compete with others by having a product or a service that's never been done before, because that's never going to happen unless you're Steve Jobs or Elon Musk. <laughs> but everyday people who just want to earn a good living, doing what they love, can simplify this process. And I think if there is a more of a demand, if you do have competitors, not to be afraid of that, because actually there is a demand. It tells you there's a demand in the marketplace. And the only thing you have to work on is positioning yourself in a different way, solving the same problem, which is totally fine, right? And so when I work with clients, it is a very intuitive process, but it's also a collaborative process. You know, I always say with people when they work with me, if you're looking for a coach to tell you what to do, you know, or give you a paint by numbers way to get somewhere, you should hire someone else because this is like, you're, you're going to put in more than I'm going to put in, okay, to make this work. And so it is a relationship we're embarking on. And we have to be very honest and transparent about what it is that we think we want versus what we do need in our lives and play around with that and experiment with that and know that what might be truthful for you today, if you did it and a month later we decide that's not the thing for you, nothing has gone wrong. <laughs> you now know something a little bit more and can pivot again. So it's very explorative. It's very playful. It's something we've forgotten to do as adults. It's almost like create an internship for what we want in our lives. We're expected to just know what we want in our lives, right? And so one of the inaugural things that I do is we do take stock. We do take stock of what are your strengths? What are your skill sets? What are your experiences that let's just take a look at them on the table and see what they look like. Because whenever someone does a skills assessment, traditionally, you know, they sort of look at, okay, my job title, right? So I'm a project manager. So they'll say my skill sets, a project manager. But what does that mean? Because if you chunked it down of how you became a good project manager, there might be a couple nuanced skills in there, right? You're really good at hiring the right people for the right projects. Maybe you're great at just like encouraging people to finish things on time and, you know, have a cohesive culture and how people complete projects together in one big team. It might be your way of actually simplifying a strategy to make sure that that project launches quicker instead of complicated strategies. I mean, there's so many ways to be a project manager, but most people haven't taken that time to kind of chunk down that job title, you know? And so that's what sort of the first place we do is sort of go, let's just stop talking about titles and talk about how, how you do that thing. What are some interesting things you do that maybe other project managers don't do? And how have you done that skill in multiple jobs you've had, you know, so that we might see some commonalities of what you keep repeating in your best work. That maybe it was a different job title. Like my resume looks for, like it's for five people, you know, for five different industries. But if you actually look under the hood of what I did to be successful in each role, I kind of did the same things, <laughs> you know, and I just didn't realize it. Right. And so my job is to kind of help them to find the red thread that binds these experiences together to kind of come up with, you know, their superpowers. Like these are the most common things you keep coming back to. Let's hold on to that for a minute. Okay. in your goodie bag. And then let's think about how could you redeploy those skills into a different direction if you were to look at matching it with a deep interest, not passion, because passion is a bit daunting of a word for others, but what else do you have a deep interest in, you know, that is potentially maybe born from you being quite agitated and frustrated at your industry where you're like, oh my God, I just wish they would just stop doing that dinosaur way of doing banking or finances or whatever. And if you had autonomy to change up how people understood finances or how people understood their health as a doctor, right? Or how people understood the legal law as a lawyer, right? What would you change? How would you want to impact in a different way in the industry you've already built so much experience in? And that's interesting for people because sometimes it's very common for people to think they have to kind of throw the baby out of the bathwater and go, well, I hate it being a lawyer in this firm, so I'm just going to not be a lawyer anymore. But there was a point in your life you were attracted to law Maybe it's for the money to start, but you know, at some point you wanted to help people. You wanted to, you were believed in justice. You believed in fairness or something or, you know, equity and something along the line, corp, the corporate bureaucracy <laughs> fucked that up for you <laughs> and you lost track of why you started being a lawyer, right? But let's go back in memory lane and come back to that energy, come back to that alignment you did feel at some point. And so if we could do that for you again, where you could create that role. How would you be a lawyer differently? Who would you help? 
if you changed up who you help, what would you help on if you weren't doing every law thing under the moon? What niche or what area would you want to specialize in? You know, so that is another interesting conversation of repurposing skill sets you've got, experience you've got without throwing it out the window and just redeploying it to a more meaningful direction. Yeah, I think that's really important, right? Deconstructing a lot of that. I Mm. love how you break that down into those specific things because a lot of stuff gets convoluted and sort of mashed together and you're sort of parsing it out. And which aspects of that are you really, really good at? And which aspects of that do you actually really, really like doing? And then finding that overlap and how you can really contribute that level of value where you're talented and you enjoy it. And then from there, once they kind of have a sense of that and they have that realization and they do that that exercise from there, then is it helping them to then figure out how do I monetize this? How do I actually build this into a sustainable location independent business? Well, not there just yet. I do a particular stage a little different than business, you know, other business coaches, because what I found was in the beginning of time when I, you know, figured out, oh, here, here are three business ideas that are good for you. Let's try this one, let's say, right? They would have the most like structured business plan, we'll go through all that, right? And then they didn't move. They were just like, oh, I'll just wait till when I have more time or I feel more confident and da 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 right? And so then I realized in my first couple of years of coaching, I was like, there's something else in between the ideation to the launch stage that is not happening for people. And what is that? And so when I dug a little deeper into why people who had 10, 20 years experience who should be very confident in what they offer weren't doing it, it was because it was missing sort of a experiential way of testing this first before they double down on a launch. Because the minute you say launch, they think website, social media, I got to hire a website designer, branding, my photographs, da, 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 da. It gets so complicated that it's daunting and then they don't want to move, right? And so I created a new stage in between the ideation to launch stage, which is called the beta testing stage or call it, and actually I call it the self-made internship stage, right? In other words, beta testing. So instead of marrying that idea right away, just like we date people first, hopefully, before we put a ring on it. I get it. You don't want to fuck it up again and make the same mistake you did in corporate where you fell out of love with your work. I get that. So we don't want to re-traumatize you. So let's experiment with what it would feel like to just try on that coat for size. See what it looks like. Maybe you might change your mind or even get better or improve your process of how you want to work with people in this sort of new realm. And most importantly, work with real humans that you are looking to charge money from, you know? So no wonder people have this sort of lack of confidence when they launch and start to go, here are my prices. And then you ask them, have you worked with anyone before? No, I haven't. I'm hoping someone will hire me. (laughs) And so they don't have testimonials, don't have any social proof, you know, they have, it's not, it, it is their first rodeo. And so no wonder they have a tough time selling because they don't know what it feels like to do that job. You know, and so what I encourage my clients to do, and we set up a month, two months at times, and we dig into testing an offer, testing the service from beginning to end and figuring out what that framework looks like. What are the concepts? What are their philosophies? What are the values that their clients rely on them for? And how could there be pushback? How could clients understand this information in a clearer way? And so I teach them to be better at their work rather than just looking good at their work, like social media or website, you know, and that internship is such a powerful experience because when they finish it, they've got testimonials, they've got social proof. It's not their first rodeo. They know what to say to clients of what they actually do, you know, that gives value. And that makes the launch process just so much easier. And they get to test and make sure that they actually like it, right? Like in your experience, when you were saying, I'm going to take on this one coaching client that reached out to me in part to see if I actually like this and want to do this business, because you might do that internship and be like, you know what, maybe this isn't exactly what I should be building around, right? Exactly, exactly. And I'm glad you reminded me because it wasn't just that one client, like that client was the first client that I said, "Mm, okay, maybe you could be my guinea pig. I actually went out and got eight more guinea pig clients for two months. And I, and I coached for free because it was something that I never did before. If it was in the international education, no problem. I'll charge for that. Cause I know I have experience, but in coaching, I didn't, I didn't feel good at that point of charging. I wanted 
me to see a cleaner slate for me to kind of have a non-pressured way, you know, for me to give advice and strategic plans for people in transition, right? And what I really learned from beta testing with eight guinea pigs is that half of them, I, I would never want to work again, <laughs> again, not because they were bad people, but because what they were looking for in the definition of a career transition, in the definition of what they believed was success in a business, wasn't in alignment with my values. So for example, I worked with individuals who didn't care what business it was. Don't, I don't care, just give me an idea that's profitable, right? Help me just find a profitable idea and I'll just make it work. Just give me the formula and I'll make it work, right? And I found I had no satisfaction coaching people like that because going buy an Amazon FBA course, like you go like that has more foolproof, you know, on what you need than me, right? I was about the human. That's what I discovered, you know, the human behavior behind the business, and how business can be a contribution of purpose. And that's a very different client that wants to work. They don't want to sit my ties in a hammock in Thailand all day, they want to contribute to society, but they want to do meaningful work. And they want to have autonomy over flexibility of their lifestyle, a little different you know, then just, I want to make money and I don't care what I do. Right. So, but that was very revealing to me about who I targeted, how I talked about my business and, you know, still is today. That's really, really awesome. I agree. I think that's totally important. And I think that the opportunity as a business owner to be very selective about your clientele and making sure that it's the right fit is both important for your own well-being, right? And enjoying the people that you work with. But it's also important because it sets those clients up for success when you have that alignment, right? And so, mm. you know, at this point, you know, in your business, after doing it for so long, who is your ideal client? Can you share a little bit about, I mean, just if, you know, there may be folks listening and things like that, um, that may be interested in this. So, you know, at what point in someone's life, in their journey, do they come to you? And who would be the ideal type of person to work with you? Well, I think my sort of best ideal client are people in sort of mid-career, you know? And so they have already sort of pounded the pavement, <laughs> you know? And maybe what's happening is that they've climbed the corporate ladder, but the view is not what they're expecting. So they have experience and a track record of actually doing work and working hard and have mastered in a lot of ways an understanding of time, you know, and effort, you know, to perfect a skill or, right, even if they might not ever do that skill again, that mindset and that, you know, perseverance of wanting to do good work, I think is important to me, you know, so the motivation is a big part of how I choose clients, <laughs> not just the fact that you can pay me, you know, so that we can really do some deep work together. Um, so mid-career, so usually, you know, people around, you know, 35 to 55 years old, this is sort of my sweet spot. And there's a lot to work with here. Uh, and it's also people that really look at business or work and life, you know, not to be just sort of the, there's a separation there. Like I, I agree in balance of like, you know, turning off the laptop and not doing business 24 seven, but like, to me, you should be the same person, you know, in business and in real life that there's no mask that you have to take off, you know, for real me and work me. Right. And I think what is the motivation to start a business for these people is that they actually love, potentially love what they do or love work in general. But they have, again, just like me, feeling a sense of that wherever they're working, the environment, the structure, the clients, the workload isn't any more satisfying. And they're not quite sure what the next door looks like, what the next chapter looks like. But they have a sneaky feeling especially after all of us going through COVID, is that maybe life might be a little bit more meaningful if I had autonomy over my time. Maybe I do have all these bucket list dreams that I don't need to wait till 65 to accomplish. Maybe since I'm young and not gr as grumpy, I should be <laughs> doing more things, you know, instead of waiting till 65 to activate my dreams when I'm jaded and crap. <laughs> which is how I imagine myself at 65, obviously, right? And and so they're motivated to go. And, you know, they're kind of like me. They're not like, I want to jump off a cliff and hope the parachute opens. Like, I want to, you know, calculate at risk. I want to do this while I'm still in my full-time job. And But I want to find meaningful work. I want to find ways to contribute, make money, be profitable, but also purposeful in the way that I make money. And those are always the clients that I really love working with. Now, as I've been growing my own business and adjusting even myself as how I define entrepreneurship and business for myself, where I've started to also do a lot of deep work in is working with existing business owners that have built 
great empires and excellent businesses. And they too have climbed the business ladder and the viewer not what they're expecting. <laughs> so they have the six, seven figure business. They Everything looks good on paper. They've got the team, blah, blah, blah. And yet they're not sleeping at night. Something's gone wrong in their relationships. Like nothing's as sweet as what they anticipated after reaching particular financial goals. And so this is a stage I also support people in because it's the same concept, (laughs) same philosophies I stand by, whether you're an employee or, or an entrepreneur, is that, again, we revisit the choices you've made, you know, and whether or not these choices for success are leading you to a life experience you want to have or is it just looking good on paper, right? And so we do the same sort of process together. A lot of times they end up sometimes not building an empire anymore and building a tinier but mightier business. And so to me, the concept of sometimes, you know, bigger is not always better at times, you know, better is better. And so how do we build a better business rather than a bigger business at all times? Yeah, I mean, and the other thing that I talk to established business owners about is the importance of location independence And the ability to create that oftentimes creatively and oftentimes in businesses that are not in traditionally virtual categories, right? Mm. Like I own a real estate brokerage, (laughs) right? I mean, called Maverick Investor Group, right? And when I was founding this company, I was telling folks, I'm going to build a completely location independent, totally virtual real estate brokerage. And it was not a traditionally virtual category at all. And Mm. folks were like, there's no way you can't run a real estate brokerage without being there to drive people around to look at houses and to, you know, sit at open houses and to do all these traditional things that we associate with real estate agents. But what we did is we just strategized about that. We brainstormed about it. My two business partners and I, we said, how would we do this, right? And then we just kind of reverse engineered it. And, you know, what we do is we serve real estate investors and we help people buy rental properties in multiple different U.S. real estate markets. And our clients can live anywhere in the U.S. or anywhere in the world. And they can buy these rental properties that somebody else has already built or renovated and leased out and they're performing. And there's a local property management company on the ground that's managing the property. So our clients don't have to live there. We don't have to live there, right? And we were able to build this. And it actually adds value to our clients mm. that we're that we're location independent because we can help them buy in different real estate markets. We don't have to convince them to just buy in this one that we're wedded to and connected to, right? So we said, wow, you know, this is great for us because we have this lifestyle freedom and, and location independence. Also, all of our staff are going to have lifestyle freedom and location independence. Also, all of our clients by buying rental properties and getting passive income are going to be able to increase their location independence and they can buy in the best real estate markets regardless of where they live. So that's an advantage. And all of this stuff just comes blossoming up. And then all of a sudden, you know, not only can we do it, but what we've done is actually more advantageous to our clients and our staff than a traditional brokerage would be. So we didn't just achieve it for ourselves. We achieved it for all of these other folks. And we're a model for other folks to look at and other businesses to be inspired by, right? I mean, I've interviewed a lot of folks on this podcast that run businesses that are in no way traditionally virtual. I mean, I've interviewed people that own wedding photography businesses in Los Angeles that actually shoot weddings in Los Angeles, but they run those businesses from Cape Town, South Africa, or wherever they're traveling, right? I've interviewed people that own an architectural design company and have Fortune 500 clients, and they do that work while traveling around the world, right? (laughs) I mean, like all of these different things. And so I'm like, you know, and then we talk about it on the podcast, right? How is it possible? How did you do that? How do you manage this thing? And there's always a way, right? People are able to do it. And so, you know, that's one of the things for me, like when I talk to business owners, like, okay, great. Maybe you're doing really good financially and you hustled and you grinded and you did all this, but like, what's your freedom of mobility look like? What's your control over your time and your working hours look like? What are the things that are really important to you? And maybe it's world travel like you and I do, or maybe it's just going to all your kids' sporting events and whatever's important to you and your lifestyle and kind of getting that next piece of it. So yeah, I totally agree with that. I mean, I think that's super important. And I love that you do both kind of folks that are transitioning from corporate into the entrepreneur or freelancer type of lifestyle, as well as the existing business owners. I think that's really significant. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think I love that you mentioned the different 
definitions of freedom as well, because I think when we look at the hashtag, you know, digital nomad or location independency, we see a very certain kind of profile, right? Which is a millennial basking in the sun with a laptop on a hammock. By the way, I've tried that. It doesn't work. You can't work like that. And you're laptop completely overheats. It's just for the photo op. It doesn't work. <laughs> but there's a, right this trend that's going around about location dependency. So when I talk to people in their 40s or 50s where they're like, actually, I do want to travel, but not as often as you. You know, I have other things that I have to do, and I don't think I'm about location independency. And so that's when I, I sort of go, okay, you're right. Like, you don't need to travel like that. But what I think is important to recognize that you might need or want is freedom of choice right? The freedom of choice. Like I have clients that don't travel at all. They live in exactly the state and city they've lived in for many years, but it's about having the freedom of time and choice to only work 20 hours a week and then write her memoir. You know, that that's it. And that's her freedom. That is her definition of a well done life, you know, to launch her memoir that's going to come out in the next five years. And so everyone's definition is different. But I think, yeah, that autonomy of time, autonomy of choices is an important human, you know, desire that I think most of us want. Yeah. And I think the other thing that's important is that your ideal lifestyle can evolve over time and mm. it can change and that's okay, right? Like you might want to travel at a certain cadence during a particular period of your life. And then maybe you want to travel at a different cadence and you might want to slow down or maybe, you know, you get into a relationship with somebody that can't travel. And so you just move to where that person is because you're location independent and you can do that. They can't, but you can, right? And so you have the advantage to go be with the person you want to be with, or you have the advantage to go and take care of sick friend or family member because other people can't leave their jobs to do it, but you can because you're location independent. So, you know, just having the opportunity and the control of your life to decide what place you're going to be in, the people you're going to spend time with, and just having total control without external restrictions really is the game. And then from there, whoever you are, whatever you like to do and whatever point of your life you're at, you can just make the decisions about, you know, how to implement that. So I do, though, also want to ask you about that in terms of your personal sort of lifestyle design and how you structured your travel journey and your travel cadence. And once you had that location independence, what did your travel journey look like sort of leading up to this moment? And what does it look like now? In the beginning, I think when I came out to live in, I wasn't, actually Bali wasn't on the map for me. I kind of came here by accident. Everything seems to be accidental in my life these days. But I sort of was in Cambodia first, and then I was in Thailand, you know, different places, trawling it out. And I gave myself, because I had low, sort of, I was quite risk averse and, you know, I had low risk tolerance, if you will, when I first started. And I still don't see myself as a high risk taker. You know, I'll take risks, but calculate it. I just gave myself six months. It was like, if I hate it being abroad, I can move back and it'll be fine. Right. And so doing that allowed me to have the courage to not have this sense of permanence in my decision that I die with this decision and I can never come back from it. So it gave me the freedom to just, okay, six months, this is the time frame I'm giving myself. And that's great, you know? And so I was only planning to be here for six months, but I never returned. That's sort of the story. But when I first started traveling, I was building Screw the Cubicle in its first year, you know? So it took some time of actually understanding how to balance working time and travel adventure time because it's very easy it overlaps you know because you're at a co-working space and someone says hey we're going to this island want to come with us and you go oh sure i'll just work on the boat you know or i'll work when we get to the resort and then that never happens because you're having fun and you're not in the headspace and i'm just someone maybe other people are built differently but i need like incubation time of like being at a desk, like, you know, even though I screwed the cubicle, I like having a desk. I like not working on the couch and the bed. And so I kind of need a little cubicle for myself as long as I'm in charge. So there's a place, you know, for me to figure out what's work time and what's play time. And actually being very good at balancing that was a, was a challenge in the beginning until I realized that I'm just not built like these other people that can just work on like a fishing boat somewhere and get things done because my work is kind of coaching. <laughs> I need to kind of be intuitive and, and be in my body and, you know, my mind to kind of come up with a blog or coach someone. I just can't do it from a fishing boat. It's never going to happen. And so I adjusted my expectations, you know, of what it looked like to travel while working. And then I think as I started 
taking more time off, you know, leaving Southeast Asia, you know, living in Europe, living in Vancouver every year, going back there as a second home, you know, going to Mexico. I spent about six months in Mexico last uh, the year before because last year was COVID. Um, it was, it, you know, it, I'm doing a lot more deep immersive experiences. So before I was traveling, maybe like maximum a month in a place, whereas these days I would spend three months or more in a particular place or location. And that allows me to really immerse in the in the culture and just know where everything is and really feel like I'm a part of the community rather than an in and out expat. You know, that's a very different experience. And so long term travel, being more permanently situated somewhere for three to six months is sort of my vibe these days. And I also think that I've embraced this notion of seasons. So like whether seasons happen just like right where four seasons in North America, I as a person kind of have seasons as well, right? There are seasons where I have itchy feet and I need inspiration and I want to travel a lot more than usual. And then there are times where I want to be grounded, you know, and actually feel like I have a ritual, a routine, familiar faces, a community, people I can rely on, (laughs) not having to find new friends again. You know, there's that stability of balance that I actually really crave as a digital nomad these days. So I don't even know what a typical definition of a digital nomad is, but you know the trend tells you that you're skip hopping everywhere, right? Collecting the miles. I am not that nomad, you know. I am kind of a little boring of a nomad, if you will, because I just sort of choose maybe a couple countries for me to go to every year, immerse myself in there, get out of there, maybe choose a different one next year, or go back if I really liked it. So slow travel is kind of my jam. Yeah, I think that's a really important sustainability pillar for long-term world travel, right? Mm. Like, I feel like there's a lot of people that sort of go out and travel around the world real quick and they do it for a year or maybe two. And that's a lot of, you know, I think what you're talking about, right? Like people throwing stuff up on Instagram and they've been to all these countries and they're doing this kind of stuff. And then a year or two later, like they're, I mean, they're back in the cubicle, if you will, probably right at some corporate job, because for them, it was more like a gap year or whatever. And they just ran around and partied or they, you know, whatever it may have been. Right. And you and I have both done this I think actually almost the exact same amount of time because I gave up my permanent base in 2013 and I've been a full-time itinerant nomad since then. And I think you're right about the same time frame. And so yes. when I meet nomads that have done this lifestyle for eight plus years, I'm really interested in the long-term sustainability pillars that allow you to sustain this lifestyle in a healthy, meaningful way and thrive in this lifestyle, right? So I would be curious. I mean, I think slow travel is a very important one. But in addition to that, you know, when we think about the sustainability pillars of social, community, friendship, and other health, right? Like all of the things that are important, I'd be super curious any reflections you have about how you maintain all of those things that you need in this type of lifestyle to be able to do it for such a long term? I think that's a great question because the whole location independent movement can be romanticized quite often. And and people think, oh, it's the best. It's, you know, there's no problems if you can make this work for yourself. But there's, uh, you know, every choice you make, there's a shit sandwich, as Mark Manson says, right? You just kind of choose the shit sandwich you're willing to swallow. (laughs) And so... To me, it's sort of like, yeah, I still have problems, uh, you know, with other aspects of my life that I have to navigate just with every regular life. The only difference is that uh, to me, it's higher quality problems that I'm willing to kind of navigate these days, right? So, you know, you touched upon one of them being community. That was sort of the one thing that I struggled with in the first year of being a digital nomad because I didn't really find my community right away because I was traveling so much right? Like, how do you build friendships and long-term community if you're skipping out every two weeks to a new location? That that doesn't make any sense. And so I had to really come back again to what was meaningful for my life. And even though I love meeting new people, and I'm somewhat of an extrovert, I'm also very introverted. I'm like, I think an ambivert. I think that's what you call me. I didn't know this because I always define myself as an extrovert. But I really prefer a handful of friends. I hate it when I'm in a room like with 30, like I hate conferences, for example. You know, I get, 
I don't, I get anxiety there, you know? And so, but people don't notice that about me. They think I love it, right? But I don't. I prefer one-on-one conversations. That's why my business is built on a one-on-one level sort of foundation. I love small groups. I like non-noisy areas. I don't, I'm not good with parties. You know, there's all these sort of interesting things that I realized about myself in how I look at the right ideal environment for me to build friendships and so forth. So I wasn't able to have sort of deep friendships and deep conversations and not having to repeat my story over and over again to strangers, you know, that felt really exhausting. And instead, I wanted it to grow. I wanted friendship to grow from a level that we started. And I couldn't do that by traveling so often. Well, then I decided to just stay put in Bali for a year on my second year of being a digital nomad. So I stayed here for a whole year. I would take little visa runs and, you know, go to Philippines and, you know, different places for sure. But I would make Bali and I embrace Bali as my home you know, for real, you know, I put a long lease down, I went to the co working space, I volunteered at the co working space, I ran events for them, I, you know, where I met Lavinia, right, that that was how we met. And I contributed as you would if you were belonging to a community. So it changed my behavior of what I did in that community. And that was great, because now I have these sort of lifelong friends, and not all of them are here, you know, there's a good handful of people I trust and commit to here that are life lifers, if you will, for now, anyway. But, you know, they're in other places. So when I go to Portugal, there's another group of people that I get to see there as well. So it never kind of ends with community, it doesn't always mean it has to be in the same physical space, right. But choosing these people that are ideal for me are important. And then I also look at my relationships in Vancouver. You know, my mother's aging, you know, she's almost 70 soon. And so these are considerations that I've been fancy free and footloose for eight years. And, you know, I'm thinking of having a family in the future. I'm thinking of being there for my mother when she gets old. And so I will have to, again, adjust how I define location independency based on the seasons of if I had a child, would I want to go back to Canada to get better medical care, you know, and do that and then maybe raise them in Bali where I get help and support, you know, and, uh, when would I come back to make sure my mother's okay, you know, or bring her to Bali, which I did at some point, and she's now retired, I can stay with me for two months, you know, so things change as things evolve. And I think adapting and, you know, sort of figuring out what's that balance and what's the ingredients you need in feeling safe and belonging in the community is really important because there's only so much fun you can have on your own. (laughs) We need people, no matter how fancy free and footloose we are. (laughs) Totally agreed. The other question that I get a lot that I'd like to ask for your reflections on is about dating and finding love and finding partnership in this lifestyle? That is definitely the number one concern and question for most location-independent people, 100%. And I think it's good you're talking about this, actually, because there are choices. And as I approach my late 30s, you know, there are some very important choices that I need to make if I want to start a family, right? If I want to think about a long-term partnership in the future. Now, I've certainly gone through my all the different sagas of dating abroad, you know, uh, it's been great. I've met some wonderful people, but it certainly comes with the territory of transient relationships where you can meet someone pretty kick-ass, but they have to return to Sydney and work their corporate job. And then you have to decide, is this good enough for me to be willing to give up such a big part of my life, which is my lifestyle freedom, to take a risk on maybe this person, you know, being my soulmate, right? Like other people don't have to have that question. Like if you're in the same city, all you're thinking about is, do I want to get on a second date with this guy? I have to think, well, am I willing to fly and waste my miles to, for this guy? <laughs> you know, so there's less motivation, if you will, you know, and so you do tend to kind of, uh, let's not go there and I'll find somebody else, right? And so that can be, the repeat sort of, you know, story that can happen. So being single and stuff like that, I'm very used to being. Now, I've had relationships with nomads as well, where we've dated for like two years, didn't end up working out, but that was good. It was a good experience. Like, okay, what does that feel like for someone that I didn't have to care that much about lifestyle choices, but it still mattered to me that our values are aligned. So I felt sometimes I was making choices on dating someone, not because of our values being aligned, but well, he can travel with me. So that just makes it easier. I tried that on for size. That didn't work either. Okay. The last thing I tried was a couple of years ago, I imported Someone I met when I went home to Vancouver, who was in transition of quitting his finance job in Deloitte, and brought him to Bali. So I did the other thing of importing a foreigner into Bali. 
And it comes with a different problem, which is this person is going through a transition. <laughs> so you're dealing with a midlife crisis. You're dealing with someone who thought this was awesome and I've left my job, but then all of a sudden you're responsible for them, right? They're in a foreign country to be with you. They have no friends. You, they, you know, they're following you half the time and then, oh shit, you know, so there's another, another shit sandwich, right? That you might be willing or not willing to do, <laughs> Right. So these are I hope that gives you a clear vision of what I've all I've tried. But, you know, it is something I still I'm no longer in that relationship either. Actually, we broke up about a month ago and it, it was an amicable breakup. But that was an interesting crossroad for me as well, where you go, wait a second, I have all the tick marks like he's location independent. He's an, a financial investor as well. So he doesn't have to work at all and is totally OK financially. He has all the time in the world. Right. To do everything we want. What could be the problem? And so the other part of what I had to navigate with someone like that is that he, I am already eight years ahead in a sense, right? I've done the transition already. I've gone through the identity crisis multiple times of leaving home and my identity there. Like it's not a overnight thing. And I forget that because it's eight years later, but he's just going through his first couple years of being alone, not, you know, answering emails from his mother who believes he's a hedonist, you know, and that he should come back and be a responsible human and dealing with the shame and the guilt of leaving a financial corporate career and, you know, like all sort of turning 40, right? Like all the things that come with a midlife crisis, like, you know, that's a different stage. And, and maybe down the road, when he goes through that transition, we could try again. But, you know, there are other things that I have to kind of navigate in that sort of situation. But I think it's not easy. I'll just say that it's not easy to date with this lifestyle. But I am hopeful that especially post COVID, when the world has sort of caught up, if you will, to this notion of travel, I mean, it's going to be like the swinging 20s or whatever, like, you know, in 2021, where everyone's like, I'm going to spend everything on travel and do all the things. And then guess what? The seeds will be planted. There will be more matches, you know, there'll just be more people, I think, embracing life outside of their neighborhood to me, there is an exciting time. And maybe sort of when that might be when I might date again, you know, but yeah, this is sort of you asked the question and you got the, the, the saga. <laughs> no, that's actually I really appreciate you sharing all that. I think that's a really meaningful answer. And I, I, I thank you for that. Lydia, let me ask you one more question and then we'll move into the lightning round and wrap this up. Just with all of the travel that you've done over all of these years and all of the places that you've been. At this point in your life, why do you continue to travel? What do you get out of it? What does travel mean to you? You know, one of the the gifts I've really, and I didn't really realize this until a couple of years ago, actually, that why did I like travel? Yeah, I, I love travel like any other person, but there was something really transformative for me when I traveled to specifically places that I've never been and are very different in what I know that is familiar and comfortable. And those have been the uh, a hard place to travel to at times because it's so unfamiliar, but also the most rewarding experiences that I've had. And what I've really realized is that traveling and deep immersion in a foreign country serves as a pattern interrupt for a lot of the things that I never knew I needed interruption on if that makes sense. And so when I move to a new place for six months and I have to kind of figure out even little things like where the grocery store is or when am I going to get my stand-up desk that I was used to and now there's no desk here and you know all the things that you have to kind of do, it interrupts even my routines because I can be quite a ritualistic person and be robotic and monotonous at times without knowing I'm doing that because we just get stuck on habitual things we do and never question it, right? So moving to a new country, immediately a curveball is thrown and I have to start from scratch again. So in a way, I have a new opportunity to rebuild my rituals, to rebuild and question, hey, when I did that before, was that, is it still serving me? And if not, I can kind of rebegin again. So it gives me permission, if you will, to uh, restart, you know? So that's been a really rewarding uh, experience and um, I think necessary uh, for humans, you know, where um, if we aren't conscious enough to give ourselves these sabbaticals to question our life choices or whether our values are still our values at the moment, you know, travel can be sort of a, a push and a force that allows you to, to do that. 
That's an amazing answer. All right. At this point, Lydia, are you ready to move in to the lightning round? I am. Let's do it. The lightning round. All right. What is one book that has significantly influenced you over the years that you'd recommend people check out? The number one book I always recommend is Greg McCown's book, Essentialism. The Disciplined Pursuit of Less. It's been one of the books that are just on, on my Kindle and I go through it every 90 days as I read a chapter. Uh, and it never gets old because it's these fundamental behaviors and habits that I think have been really essential. You know, of course, the book Essentialism uh, that's really supported me in, in making what are the choices that are truly, truly, truly necessary for what I'm looking for. Because as someone who is a recovering perfectionist, as someone who is a recovering doer, you know, I do first before I consciously think at times, you know, because I need to prove myself, right? That's the thing I'm trying to unlearn is that it allows me to sort of question whether or not this makes sense. And this is worth my time, even though it might look like it is or doing more things to believe you'll get more when actually doing less is actually might get you to the goal a little faster. So I've been learning a lot of what can be less but better, you know, what's truly essential for the goals that I have, and then changing and adapting my behavior to be a little bit more in alignment with those decisions rather than the sort of unconscious behavior or habits that I've been used to. That's awesome. What is one travel hack that you use that you can recommend to people? Because I travel with an open-ended ticket, usually, I don't have a return ticket, right? Because I don't know how long I'll stay, and I like keeping that window open. <laughs> The airports don't like this. They want to know you're going to get out and, you know, or whatever, right? And I'm like, I am going to get out. I just don't know when. And so I want to have that freedom. And so the one thing that apparently a lot of people don't know about is that you can buy an onward ticket with a particular company. I use onward.flights and you just get a temporary ticket that's real. And it allows you, if you get, you know, questioned on like, when are you going to leave? You have an onward ticket. And of course you have to leave the country legally, you know, when the time comes, whatever the duration is, but it kind of bypasses the fact that you need to decide on a date right away. That's a good one. <laughs> All right. If you could have dinner with any person that's currently alive today that you've never met, just you and that person for an evening of dinner and conversation, who would you choose? Easy. Esther Perel. I love Esther. She's um, a Belgian uh, psychotherapist, but I mean, she's done TED Talks and uh, she has an amazing podcast show called Where Do We Begin, where you are pretty much a fly on the wall listening to therapy sessions of couples. But it's not just about couples. It's her whole motto is that, you know, the, she says the quality of our relationships, uh, sorry, the quality of our life depends on the quality of our relationships. And I really love her brain on how to navigate modern day relationships and actually deal with not just love relationships, but how do we leave the code dependency of what we believe or what we need, you know, as a human and learn how to build relationships of different kinds to serve the needs that we have as multifaceted humans. So if you haven't checked her out, she is, yeah, very awesome. That is awesome. I will definitely check that out. All right, Lydia, knowing everything that you know now, if you were able to go back in time and give one piece of advice to your 18-year-old self, what would you say to 18-year-old Lydia? Gosh, there would be so many things. Um, but if I was to find sort of the common theme of what underlying things I really want to say, um, it, it would just be, I think, to stop trying so hard and trying to control everything. You know, but I also don't blame the 18 year old self because I, as I said, needed to survive. So you do have to, you know, get yourself out of a, you know, abusive sort of family relationship and you have to kind of make ends meet. But at some point to realize that it's no longer hard. I think that was the thing that I didn't realize till a lot later where I was still operating in this sort of scarcity survival mode, like stuck at 15 years old, you know, even as a 25 year old. And just to know that, okay, you can stop feeling that now. It's okay now. You've, you've done it. And so just let go, just let go. And, and cause you don't know what's going to happen. You can't control the future. And so just ride it and just remain curious and yeah, just try not to control everything. <laughs> awesome. All right. Of all of the places that you have now been, what are your top three favorite travel destinations you'd most recommend people check out? Well, the first one is no-brainers, Penang, right? That's definitely, I mean, you haven't been as well. So you, that's got to be on your, you know, travel uh, destination number one after COVID, I think. We have to meet up there and have a laksa together. Um, the second place I loved two years ago when I lived there is Oaxaca in Mexico. A place that, again, when people think of Mexico, they don't go there. And But it is my 
favorite place so far in Mexico. The food is amazing. Uh, it's like Europe in Mexico and just not as saturated with a bunch of expats and <laughs> digital nomads just yet. So you can actually walk into a cafe and people are not working at their laptops. It's just a regular coffee shop. And so that's been a real treat. Um, and then the third favorite destination is um, I loved, if you love island and you just love sort of untouched beauty, El Nido in the Philippines. I really loved going there. Maybe it's a bit busier these days than when I went there five years ago. But yeah, the internet's kind of weak, so you might not want to work there. But it was absolutely incredible, like diving, snorkeling, and just the people were amazing. So El Nido is a, another sort of secret Philippines area that not a lot of people choose right away. You know what, Lydia? I have not been to any of your Ooh. top three recommendations, and I will meet you in any of them. <laughs> Penang we can do first, Deal. but the other two also sound amazing and uh, we'd love to go to both of them. So those are really good picks. Like This is why I ask this question because I'm like jotting down, like building my own bucket, <laughs> Getting your list bucket list of like these recommendations. That's entirely my motive for asking these questions, of right. course. So that is amazing. All right. Last question. What are your top three bucket list destinations, places you've never been highest on your list you'd most love to go? Okay, is this was a hard one. This was even harder than the other question because there were so many places I want to go to. But the first one has a kind of a funny reason why I want to go there. And the first one is Bhutan. I have never really done any research in Bhutan or anything like that. But one funny thing happened to me when I was in Bali when I first got here is I <laughs> saw a psychic and for fun, like I didn't really believe in any of those things. And but somehow she knew that I had been seeking for my a culture and history because my family actually, we don't know where we came from. We say Malaysia, but we're not Malaysian. So we assume we're Chinese Malaysian, but because uh, my entire family has grudges against each other. So they haven't spoken to each other in generations. We have no idea where my great, great, great grandfather came from. And so we could be Chinese. My dad looks Filipino. I have an uncle that looks Indian, right? I have an aunt that looks Vietnamese. They're all over the map. And I really don't know if I can even call myself a Chinese Malaysian. But she knew and I never said that to her. She said, you need to go to Bhutan, because that's where you're going to find some answers about your history. And I went, really? Anyway, so I, I that's why it's on the list. <laughs> Just so that I might be able to find some answers. The second place is something that's been on my bucket list, which is the Serengeti in Africa. Definitely want to go to Serengeti. And then another one, which I think is a closer dream that I should be waiting for, is recommended by our mutual friend Lavinia, Transylvania, Romania. Definitely would go there. It's a real place, apparently. Those are really good picks. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, I would love. I have also not been to Romania yet. Bhutan mm. is supposed to be unbelievably yes. gorgeous. I mean, mm. all the pictures I've seen of Bhutan, my gosh. If I mean, if anybody has not seen pictures of Bhutan, just Google it and do an image search. I mean, it is just stunning. Is, yeah, out of this world. Yeah, I would love to do that. And then I was in, I, I did East Africa for about a month in uh, 2018. And I went on a safari in Maasai Mara, which is on the Kenyan side, right? And then when mm. you go over the border in the Serengeti, so I was right next to it there. And it was really, really, really special and amazing. So I think that's a really good one to keep high on your list. Awesome. All right, Lydia, at this point, I want you to let folks know how they can find you, follow you on social media, check out some of your amazing content and come into your universe. Well, screwthecubicle.com is sort of my home base. So, you know, uh, that's where you can find me. Hopefully you'll remember that URL. Um, but right in the homepage is sort of, uh, you know, exactly where you need to go, right? Like there's one of the things that people like uh, tuning in for is sort of my weekly shows on YouTube. So this is sort of where you can get the most, Lydia, you know, of I interview lots of people, what I call the corporate escape story segment of people that have sort of left the nine to five in an unconventional way and what they built to have a meaningful life in business. So it's not just stories coming from me, it's sort of, you know, other people from different walks of life, different backgrounds, you know, that I think are inspirational to sort of be learning from. And then I'm not hugely on social media, like, religiously, but, and I'm kind of getting off Facebook. I'm not really doing any work on there at these, these moments, but Instagram is sort of a place that I do share a little bit about my personal life. And, you know, people are wondering where I'm currently based. What am I doing as an expat? How do I, you know, do all the things I do share a bit more of kind of behind the scenes of lifestyle choices. 
using my Instagram channel for that. But I think if people are interested to kind of learn more about building meaningful businesses, transitioning from corporate, my website's sort of a good place to start. There's some really good complimentary trainings on there. There's one called Reinvent Yourself, which is sort of all the powerful questions that you want to be asking yourself about what's next and what is the next chapter of your life and work that you're easing into. And then there's also another training there called How to Launch a Business You Love, which is uh, going to incorporate a lot of what we talked about today, which is what are is my genius zone? How do I incorporate it to a business I love? And what are the foundations of this business that is most important to focus on rather than the glitzy, shiny things that make you look good in business, but actually doesn't help you be good in your business. So anyway, check that out in, in screwthecubicle.com and yeah, connect with me. Let me know you watched the show and you know, say hello. Awesome. We are going to link all of that up in the show notes. So folks can just go to one place at themaverickshow.com, go to the show notes for this episode, and there you are going to see all of the links for how to find Lydia and all of the wonderful stuff that she's up to, as well as all the other things that we talked about in this episode, her book recommendations and everything else. So it's all going to be at one place, themaverickshow.com. Go to the show notes for this episode. Lydia, thank you so much for coming on the show. This was amazing. It was. And next time we must do it live somewhere, right? In the middle of a hawker stand, I think, with the noise. <laughs> Penang, for sure. I mean, I feel like that's got to be got super it. high on the destination list to meet up there would be amazing. And we'll do a part two in person. So thank you so much for coming on. This was awesome. Thank you, Matt. All right. Good night, everybody. Be sure to visit the show notes page at themaverickshow.com for direct links to all the books, people, and resources mentioned in this episode. You'll find all that and much more at themaverickshow.com. Learn how Maverick Investor Group can help you by cash flowing rental properties in the best U.S. real estate markets, regardless of where you live. Schedule a free phone consult today at themaverickshow.com slash consult. Now you can buy rental properties with tenants and local property management in place so you don't have to be a landlord or a rehabber to get your questions answered and discuss how Maverick Investor Group can help you meet your real estate investing goals. Schedule your free free phone consult today at the maverickshow.com forward slash consult. If you like podcasts, you will love audiobooks and you can get your first one for free at the maverickshow.com slash